I'll tell you something. I'm glad I found out in time just what a partnership with a pair of wankers like you would have been. A sleeping partner's one thing, but you're in a fucking coma. No wonder you got an energy crisis your side of the water. That's British. We used to have a bit more vitality, imagination, chatting a Dunkirk spirit, know what I mean? The days when Yanks could come over here and buy up Nelson's column and an Arley Street surgeon and a couple of windmill girls are definitely over. Now look, shut up, you long streak of paralysed piss. Hi, welcome to the Bench and Movie Club. My name's Charlie. My name's Ben. And since it's Easter, uh, we've decided to do, or well, my choice this week has been The Long Good Friday, the 1980 British gangster classic directed by John McKenzie from a screenplay by Barry Keefe. Um, ben, you hadn't seen this film before, so I've seen this film <laughs> You mug. You melt. Yeah, yeah no, of course I've seen this film. Brilliant. I haven't film. seen it for a while and it is, it is still fantastic. Mm. And I'll tell you what I did notice this time round. So many faces in it. Mm. I recognise so many faces. There was um, Carl Hoffman, who is Johnny from Party Party. Yeah. He was also in Brush Strokes, wasn't he? Yeah. You've got um, Brian Hall, who is probably best known for playing Terry the chef in 40 Towers. Yeah. Um, Gillian Talforth. Yeah. She's Kathy from EastEnders. Paul Barber, Denzel from Falls and Horses. Yeah. And uh, little Dexter Fletcher. Yeah. Who was um, cleaning his car. Yeah. So, I mean, Dexter Fletcher, there's been some... F- especially as a child actor, because he was in Bugsy Malone, Malone. just before this. A Long Good Friday. He was also in Elephant Man as well, yeah. which is a brilliant film. But this was filmed in... This was actually completed in 1979, it just wasn't released till um, late, I think, November 1980. Yeah. Because of complications. Yeah. But the actual film is already and done. In, so it's really a film from the 70s. And, of course, it's got um, the lead, Bob Hoskins, as Harold Shand, who is in Roger Rabbit, Mermaids, Mona Lisa. You know, Fantastic. One of my favourite actors sadly died 10 years ago. Yeah. Pretty much 10 years ago this month. This is also partly in honour of him. He was one of those people who I always thought I'd love to have worked with. I'd love to have directed, put him in one of my films, something like that. And he, he, his career could have even been bigger because he was. There's a famous story about him. Was he was approached to play Al Capone mm. off the back of this? Yeah. Brian De Palma had seen this. Thought he looks the spitting image of Al Capone, which he does or he did. And so he sat down, had lunch with him, telling him all about the Untouchables, saying he's got Kevin Costner, Sean Connery, blah, blah, blah. Talking about the story. The only thing is, studio wants Robert De Niro. Now, he'll probably pass it up. But just letting you know, he's their first choice. And so Bob Hoskins, oh, all right, great, thanks for that. A couple of weeks later, Bob Hoskins gets a, a, a letter in the post saying, I'm sorry, they went with, with uh, Robert De Niro, said yes. He's $30,000 for wasting your time. Okay. So Bob Hoskins wrote back, said, if there's any other films you don't want me to do, <laughs> yeah. let me know. Yeah. But I think I put Bob Hoskins on a par with like Al Pacino and Rob oh, De Niro. Yeah, he's fantastic, especially He is this. a fantastic actor and you forget exactly how good he is mm. until this film. Mm. This film is like, it's like, it's sort of Scarface. Mm. It's sort of Taxi Driver. Do yeah. you know what I mean? It's like, he is, he's amazing in this film. And, and uh, Michael Caine was a big fan of this film, so when he saw it, he worked. He reached out to the director. He became really good friends with Bob Hoskins, and that's yeah. why Michael Caine worked with him a lot. Yeah. Like I think Michael Caine is also in Mona Lisa opposite Bob Hoskins. Yeah. But have you seen Mona Lisa? A long time ago. So he's long driving around this prostitute, and he starts sort of falling mm. for her, and he wants to look. I'd like to see her. that again. Actually, I, I can't remember. What it was. was it? It was. A, was it a proper feature film? Or was it like a no, TV it's, film? No, it's a proper feature film. But, and as I said, it's got Michael Caine as this gangster who's sort of, Bob Hoskins' job is just sort of this little run-around man. No, who's, who's it? Oh, you know who's, who I think's in it? Clark Peters. No, that Clark Joe, Peters? Joke Jacobs' dad, who was in... Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. Not in yeah, Hill. Yeah, yeah. Helen Mirren play, plays his wife, Victoria, who's known as playing for the Queen, or playing as Queen, um, is in Red and the film Hitchcock and amongst many other things. She's always, you know, she became really big, for, I think, round about the Queen time, you know. Yeah, I remember in a film years ago called The Cook, The Thief, His Wife and Her Lover, mm. 
or something. It's really weird. And they've got someone laying on the table naked eating eating food on off of them. Or something really weird. Yeah. It was like really quite arty. That's your film. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that was in that film. Brian Marshall as Councillor George Harris. I, I know him from... There's a film that I really like, which you wouldn't have seen, and loads of people hate, and that's the 1980s Punisher, where he plays Dino Moretti in the beginning of that. He sadly died in 2019. Okay. Paul Freeman as Colin. He was in Hot Fuzz and Raiders of the Lost Ark. P.H. Moriarty as Razors. No, he's, he's a henchman with a cut face. He's in Lockstock. Yeah, he came into acting quite late in life. I think into his forties, he'd been a boxer and done various other things. Then he came round about this time. He was also in Jaws Three. Uh, he he was in Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels. He was the one of the main villains, Harry the Hatchet. And funny enough, you've also got in this Alan Ford um, as Jack, who's the main villain in Snatch, the follow-up film. And he was also he was the taxi driver in American Wealth in London. I know you mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And Cockneys versus Zombies. Have you even mentioned his, his white hand man yet, have you? The one who was in Casualty. Oh, What's Derek, his name? Derek Thompson. What's his name? What's he play? Who's the Jeff? One he, the one he stabs up. But Derek Thompson plays his right hand man, Jeff, who's most famous for being in Casualty, apparently, but I've never yeah, seen him. he plays him. Charlie, I think, in Casualty. He was in it for years. Oh, like 20 okay. years, I think. Right. Might still be in it, as far as I know. Paula Melville is Dora. She was Vivian's mum in The Young Ones. Oh, who was she? Dora. Who's Dora in it? I don't know. <laughs> so I'd recognise her from yeah. the young ones because she's quite distinctive. Yeah, it's quite funny in that bit. And they've uh, been around about the same sort of time, just before young ones. And do you know how Gillian Telforth got the part? Yes, I do know. Good. Do right, George Cooley is. <laughs> yeah, you go on. Um, it was actually, I've got it written down as one of the facts. So <laughs> she wanted to tell it, you can tell it. Her sister her. Kim, go on, you know, yeah. say it. Yeah, uh, Kim Telforth was originally cast in the small role of Sherry. Unfortunately, because of striking airlines, it left her stranded in the USA. So she suggested that her sister Gillian Telforth uh, play the role instead. This led to her being cast in EastEnders as Kathy Bill. Mm. So I bet she was quite glad about <laughs> sister, well, sister being stranded. Been. No. Her sister might be up. I don't yeah. think it was... It's only a small part. Yeah. We used to do a stream. Yeah, she might have then done, like, been in EastEnders or something. You don't mm. know. It's mad how things happen, isn't it? You had Trevor Laird as Jim. He's in Quadrophenia, Love, Honour and Obey, Secrets and Lies. And, of course, Pierce Brosnan. Yes. In, I think this is his first... This fi- was his actual first um, feature yeah. film. And he only says... Hi. Hi. Yeah, which he improvised. Yeah, because he wasn't actually going to say nothing at all. No. Well, he was going to say bye. Possibly the the biggest actor uh, to come out of this, because he went on to, of course, be James Bond. He was in Remington Steel, Mamma Mia, Thomas Mrs. Doubtfire. Doubtfire. Mrs Doubtfire, yeah. yeah Bob Hoskins done well. Oh, yeah, no, 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 but I'm, I'm saying, yeah, out, they've of, all done, they've out done the supporting well. cast, out of the right. supporting ones. OK. Um, in America, the studio dubbed Hoskins' voice... Uh, and Hos- uh, Bob Hoskins threatened to sue, mm. so they, they, they went without it. I mean, why would you want to do that? But I suppose the East London accent yeah. is quite a hard accent to understand, and I was worried that, uh, that the Americans weren't going to understand it. But it's getting dubbed by someone from Wolverhampton. Yeah, but he was... He, he go, he went I'm from ballistic. London! Yeah. You go misread it, people. He, he, was, he went ballistic and he threatened to sue, which, they in, in the end, they just left it. Mm. Which, the, the Americans understand what he's saying. Yeah, what they did, though, they, when they, they made the version for American audiences and it begins with a screen showing Cockney and London mobster terms along with their definitions, and it suggested that this inspired Quentin Tarantino to begin Pulp Fiction with the written definition of Pulp Fiction. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah. So it's mad how things all sort of sort of spider off of each other, don't they? Yeah. You know. Now this film, in case you don't know the film, which I, I expect you would have watched it before listening to a podcast about it, is about um, Harold Shand, who's an East End uh, mobster, comes back and it turns out that his friend and his right hand man has been dealing with the IRA and various things have gone wrong, and the IRA are systematically blowing up places that Harold owns because mm, they think the guy, it's him yeah because he was working under his name uh, fantastic I probably it's probably the best British gangster film definitely you know it's definitely uh, I'm pretty sure it's number one it ain't dated so I mean it's still it's, no, it's still separate so time. relevant and it's pro pre-Docklands yeah 
prophetic. It's the way he predicts what's going to happen with the Docklands. Yeah. The, the rejuvenation of the area, and it yeah. was. And there's a reason I love Canary Wolf. I love Canary Wolf and West India Quay because as a child, I remember seeing it be built. I remember in primary school, them taking us to the uh, Canada One, saying, oh, it's not going to be as tall now because of airplanes. It's going to actually lose a couple of floors. They're going to be covered. So it was actually going to be taller than what it yeah. was. And at the time, it was like the tallest um, building in the country. I remember it all going up, obviously, as well, yeah. yeah. So and how it's such a beautiful area now. It's so, yeah. from what it was, which was just like But he predicted down. it in this film. Yeah. He predicted so exactly was what was going on, what was going to happen. But that was because he'd heard councils, he'd had conversations with someone in the pub or something, and... A council officer or something has said mentioned about the redevelopment of the Docklands mm. area, yeah. and that put the idea in his head. Yeah. But it was like it it couldn't have uh, gone any better. Oh no, it's spot on. It was spot on. He had, he had the inside track on that, and this is the thing: the, the mafia missed a trick there, didn't they? At the end, when he got the mafia running back to their own country, and he yeah. has that fantastic speech where he digs them out because he's been kissing up to yeah. them the whole film, sort of bending over backwards to try and make things right and goes yeah. right. I'd like to give something a bit better than an hot dog. What I'm looking for is someone who can contribute to what England has given to the world. Culture, sophistication, genius. A little bit more than an hot dog. Know what I mean? We're in the common market now. And my new deal is with Europe. I'm going into partnership with a German organisation. Yeah, the Krauts. They've got ambition, know-how. And they don't lose their bottle. Look at you. The Mafia. <laughs> I've shit them. Yeah, it's a fantastic <laughs> scene. It's, it, and it's brilliant. And it I'm, is brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's so great to see him just sort of... Yeah. The, the the anger sort of building up in him and then you think what a great way to end but of course it doesn't end because then he gets in the car yeah, as I say spoilers I mean but wow this mm. has got to be one of the best endings ever yeah you know when you sort of say okay what's the best ending of a film this is up this there. is definitely got to be up there because it's yeah. the acting in that scene did you also know yeah did you know that in the final scene the music gets inexplicably louder. And this was because the director, John McKenzie, was giving directions to Hoskins as he went through like a range of emotions like over his impending demise. Mm. Ultimately, the scene was then muted, but the, they kept the loud music. But that's the reason why the music was originally louder, because mm. he was saying, going, right, he, he going through the stages. It's like going through the stages of grief. Yeah. And he's going, it's right. Like he's about to yeah, die. But he's, he's acting in that without saying a word mm. is absolutely amazing. That yeah. is just got to be. That is you can just. There's so, no words. You don't need any words for that. He is just. He is. He is amazing in that. You mm. couldn't. Have done, no one could have done that better. And so him and Pierce Brosnan never never actually met because they no. shot them separately. That was the very first thing they shot. Was them shown, driving back. yeah? I only found that out today. That's really unusual. Mm. Like they filmed them. So he's actually they filmed them scenes completely separate. I suppose Pierce Brosnan's just sitting there with a the gun. Yeah, he's like he ain't got to do nothing really, is he? He's like yeah. Bob Hoskins has got all the. The, the different ranges of emotion going through his face. Oh, it's fantastic. Bob Hoskins did get an Oscar nomination a few years later for Mona Lisa. So, did he ever win an Oscar? No. It's a shame. Yeah. The film was directed by John McKenzie and was produced for £930,000 by Barry Hansen from a script by Barry Keefe with a soundtrack by the composer Francis Monkman. And it was screened at the Cairns, Edinburgh and London Film Festivals in 1980. It was under the title The Paddy Factor. The original story had been written by Keith R. Hansen when the latter worked for Euston Films, a subsidiary of Thames Television. Euston did not make the film, but Hansen bought the rights from Euston for his own company, Calendar Films. Although Hansen designed the film for the cinema and all contracts were negotiated under a film, not a TV agreement, the production was eventually financed by Black Lion a subsidiary of Lose Grade ITC Entertainment for transmission via Grades ATV on the ITV network. The film was commissioned by Charles Denton, at the time both program controller of ATV and managing director of Black Lion. After Grade saw the finished film, he allegedly objected to what he saw as the glorification of the IRA, which I didn't think it necessarily glorified the IRA. No. I think it just showed... I think the problem is... And why the film was controversial was at the time Thatcher was cracking down on the IRA. There mm -hmm. was making there was there was all the, the troubles out in Ireland. When this film came out, they say, "Well, no, they win. 
we can't have the IRA win. That's what kind of message does that show us? Because they do pretty much. Mm. You know, they despite like his best efforts, especially towards the end, we've got the the racing, which again is a fantastic scene in this. Yeah, the other names that was also suggested for the film was Harold's Kingdom, uh, Havoc, and a Citadel of Blood. Oh, Long Good Friday beats it all. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, also, you know the bit where Harold meets Parky, uh, yeah. King is now, but it's, that's where King George V docks are. That's actually where London City Airport is. Wow, yeah. So it's so mad, like, yeah, all these places. And also, another mm-hmm. one where he's got his boat, mm. the berth where Harold's boat is docked is West India Quay, which is now part of the Canary Wharf estate. Yeah, which is my favourite place. That's yeah. where I want to live, West yeah. India Quay. The original first draft of the script was written in three days. <laughs> in 3D. 3D. He's written in 3D. Really yeah. Uh, the film was scheduled to be televised with heavy cuts on the 24th of March 1981. And because of the planned cuts, in late 1980, Hansen attempted to buy the film back from ITC to prevent ITV screening the film. The cuts, he reckons, would have ended up the film to be about 75 minutes and would make little sense. And mm. that's, you think, oh, it would not. It's very violent. Good. So before the planned ITV transmission, the rights to the film were bought from ITC by George Harrison's company, Handmade yeah. Films, uh, for around £200,000, less than the production costs. It gave the film a cinema release. So it's good. Well done, George Harrison. Mm. He also uh, helped fund Life of Brian. Yeah. yeah. he done well. He done well. Easter Saved film. a couple of good films there. Uh, two scenes of the movie were based on true events. That's the, the widow lifting her vow and spitting in someone's face. Mm. And also the bit where the man was nailed to the floor. And when the man was asked, like, what happened, he says, like, don't you understand English, son? Uh, it was a do-it-yourself accident that went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. like, proper gangster talk, talking it? And the actors being held upside down had to be supported during breaks to stop them from passing out. And that was um, the bit of them actually hanging upside down was actually Bob Hoskins' idea. Yeah. It was nominated at the British Academy Film Award in 1982. Best actor in the leading role, Bob Hoskins, was nominated. At the Edgar Awards in 1983, it was uh, it won Best Motion Picture Screenplay for Barry, Barry Keith. The Evening Standard British Film Award uh, awarded Bob Hoskins Best Actor in 1982. And the Los Angeles Film Critic Association Award nominated for Best Foreign Film. Did you know about the sequel? I did hear about a sequel. He was, wrote a sequel, didn't he? Mm. There was an unproduced sequel uh, that Barry Keith wrote called Black Easter Monday, set 20 years after the events of the first film. It opened though, with Bob Hoskins' character, Harold Shand, escaping from the IRA after the car was pulled over by police. Nah. So I'm glad it never got nah. materialised. Nah, it, you know he's going to die. He's not getting out of that. Well, in this, he would have retired to Jamaica, then returned to stop the East End being taken over by the Yardies. However... Thankfully, the film was never made. And in one of the last interviews, Keith seemed unconcerned by the lack of development. He says, in some ways, I'm glad because sequels are usually diminishing returns. To put it up there with Casablanca, no one wants Casablanca too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah in the scene where Harold and Razors enter the town hall to, com- to confront Councillor Harris, an additional scene was filmed and it had to be cut for like, length for, uh, reasons. The screenwriter Barry Keith bitterly regretted it as he claimed that it was his favourite scene of the whole movie. So that's a shame. Yeah, be so nice. what was that then? If it's that he reckons that it was it's his favourite scene of the whole film. Yeah. Like, what the fuck was it then? So what, how good was it? So it must have been good. And I hate that. There's all these... But they used to just cut things and that was it. They'd chuck it. So there was no... They didn't save anything back then. Yeah. They never copied anything. Like this day and age, it's all digital. They would save it. Whereas, like, there's the amount of fantastic footage and cuts that have just gone forever because they've cut it, you mm. know, to, to to an inch of its life. Uh, Paul Barber, in an interview he gave a few years ago, of course, you mentioned before, from Only Falls yeah. and Horses of Form, wasn't he? He recalls that he went along to Brixton, where they were filming the scene, and John said to him, go and wait in the pub and learn your lines. I had a couple of drinks, so by the time I had to do the scene, being pulled out of bed, the costume lady had to pour coffee into me before I went onto the set. There was no audition, I just jumped straight in it. And I didn't have a clue what it was about. I remember standing in front of P.H. Moriarty and Bob Hoskins, and I was scared. I thought, oh my God, what am I doing here? This guy's a gangster. It was my first time doing stuff like that, and I thought I was involved in a snuff movie. <laughs> they were interrogating me. P.H. Moriarty, who played Razors, had a machete. They called him the human spirograph because he had so many scars. I played it fearful because I was. 
So he says, <laughs> I was genuinely nearly crying when they did that take. Bob looked at me as if to say, you have melted my heart, mate. He was great, so generous, so patient. <laughs> and did you know the scene with, you know when he, he kills his friend, doesn't he? In the scene where he kills his friend Jeff with the glass, yeah. originally that was actually going to be a sabre scene. It was like a sabre swords, and he was actually going to cut his head off. Yeah. But I think it works better with the glassing, because that's nasty enough. And it looks so realistic when you yeah. see it all squirting out of his neck. Yeah, and when people get glassed, you think, mm. that's what it must be like. And you can mm. see the shock on his face when he realises what he's done. He was angry Daddy at him. was, wasn't he? Daddy was glassed. Yeah. Probably not like that, wasn't it? Daddy was glassed well, It would have badly. been similar like that. I mean, it was very close oh, to the jugular. God. It's lucky, I don't know, I've known it before you was born though, so it's lucky that he didn't die because you yeah. wouldn't be here, would you? No, Rosie. Well, we played it up, right? You went to school with Princess Anne, played hockey with her, all that. There's lacrosse at Benedon. Hockey's frightfully vulgar. Yeah, yeah, plenty of that. <laughs> the Yanks love snobbery. They really feel they've arrived in England if the upper classes treat them like shit. Gives them a sense of history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The role of Harold Shand was specifically written for Bob Hoskins. Helen Mirren says that this film gave her fantastic uh, street cred in the East End of London. Yeah, you can imagine. Even though she says that she is a Londoner, she's born in London, but you can tell it's like she went to college. She was all sort of, she's more well spoken, yeah. isn't she? She's not in that kind of world. Well, speaking but, of that as well, actually, Helen Mir Mirren fleshed out the character as she said originally. It was, she was like a boring gangster's mole, and she wanted to give her like more depth and intelligence. So like, that's, so the character was changed. Like, she added more bits, and she sort of wanted to be like an equal, mm. like a, a partner, rather than just some bimbo. Yeah, and it works. It works really well because it gives her it gives her more depth. And uh, yeah, there was a remake of the movie was announced in two thousand and seven, but it came to nothing. I mean, can you imagine? Oh, What's yeah. the point of remaking well, it? No, you um, can't. No, what's the point of remake? Yeah. Exactly, it's so of its time. It's perfect that era. The East End gangs aren't like no. how they were then. No. That was pretty much coming towards the end of that sort of craze type era. It was actually, you know? yeah. yeah. It was after that because then you obviously got a lot more influx of European gangs and ones from across the world like the Yardies and and stuff like that coming in later in. And in the end, it, it weren't that sort of East End. Yeah. Um, the East End gangs all sort of phased out, didn't they, round about that time. I mean, you got, you know, yuppies and all that started coming in and, you know, things started changing. It was all more about money and mm. then Canary Wolf got built and, you know, it was all um, well, it's file fire, faxes it? and, and, and mobile what, phones and stuff, eh? What they've done to Stratford, how they've built that yeah, all up and yeah. stuff, that was a dump. Oh, I mean, Stratford it's still, right it's still dump. not brilliant, but it's not better since the it Olympics. Was a right dump, Stratford. Yeah, but no, I've always loved this film and Bob Hoskins in particular in this, I think, as I said, is a fantastic oh, performance. I think the whole cast is really good. I think it's a shame in a way that he... I know he, I said about that story about him not getting the Al Capone part. I think it's a shame he didn't get that part because I, even yeah. though I'm a big fan of Robert De Niro, I think he would have played it so much better. Mm. He can do an American accent, as you've seen in like Mermaids and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yeah. He looks the spitting image of Al Capone. Mm. Same size, same build, yeah. same face, same hair. Yeah. It was, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Why would... Just because someone's a bigger name, but this is obviously shows you where money involves exactly. in something. Exactly. I mean, he's good, isn't he? Robert De Niro. I mean, but I've never seen Al Capone. The Untouchables. The Untouchables. That's a good film. The Untouchables okay. is a good film. Yeah. It's such a good snapshot of London, of the time, of the era, yeah. that the dawn of the 80s. Yeah. Like, and it does... Even considering this was made in 79, it does predict... The way, not just what was going to come in the 90s, but also had that sort of big business 80s mentality. Yeah. You know, with all the, like you said, with all the uppies coming in. And it's one of those films like Mum's been saying to us for ages, oh, do one on Long Good Friday. Mm. Oh, that's a brilliant film. And I thought, well, when's a better time of year to do it than now? Yeah. And also, like the area where Denzel, like the run down rough area, mm. you know, he's driving past these days, yeah, it's a shithole. I think, fucking hell, they're all probably like about fucking three, four million pound ounces now. Oh, yeah, definitely. They're like, you know, they would be, you wouldn't be able to afford any of them now. It's no. amazing how things have changed massively, you know, the, like, that no, like, beyond anyone's, mm. like, um, imagination. You never would have dreamed that they would have gone. Right. Which one's Errol's house? Never heard of him, mate. <laughs> Razors. A little bit of respect here, I think. Mean. Fucking hell. 
fuck are you doing? You crazy? I don't like people looking up my nose when I'm talking to them. He could have killed me. Well, it's been going to day. I've probably got you a cut price funeral. Now, where was house? Which one is it? Number 33. Used to be a nice street, this. Decent families. No scum. Fantastic film. I can't, rem I can't remember the last time I saw it, but I know it was... Well, mm. at least about 20 years ago, I think. I've watched this um, a few times in recent history because um, with mum, like, it's coming up to Easter and uh, mm. if we realise it's Good Friday, she'll go, oh, we've got to watch Long Good Friday. Yeah. Like how people would watch Christmas films. Yeah. Now, it's never going to have loads of other Good Friday films. I mean, Easter films themselves, it's yeah. hard to think of any. Oh, this is just the best. Oh, yeah. Um, Fantastic title. Yeah. Definitely the best title. And, and this is the, but the thing is, you don't always put two and two together because the long at the beginning throws it off. Good Friday, everyone knows what Good Friday is, but yeah. when someone says the long Good Friday, they think, what's so good about it? Yeah. It's not about it, it's a religious thing because obviously it's, people were a lot more religious back then. You know, he uses religion. He's like, you can't do this on a Sunday or, or mm. on Good Friday. Mm. It's, it's sacrilegious, you know, making a big deal of it. That amazing mm. film, really good. I'm glad you chose this. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, on IMDb, it got 7.6 out of 10. All right, okay. Which is good. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, it got uh, 97 by the critics. Yeah. 89 by the audience. Yeah. So I would have thought you actually had... 90, I would have thought the audience would have been even higher. Um, no, yeah. The budget was a bit weird for me to find out. Um, 930,000. Yeah. And it made 426,000, which that can't be right. Uh, and I was right. looking... Well, so, so, so it didn't lose money. Yeah, no, it's just really weird that, I mean, it doesn't, I couldn't work out what the budget was and how much it made, mm. like, worldwide. Like, it's, it's got a, it's definitely not a loss. It's a, it's a classic film. It's a popular film. It's just hard for yeah, me to find the, the, um, the finances. But the thing is, there are loads of people who aren't familiar with this film. They yeah. don't know it. You know, it's like I told someone today, I'm going to do Long Good Friday. Mm. And they're like, oh, is it any good? Yeah, that but you know, growing saying? up, anyone would have known this film. Of this a certain was, generation, yeah. it's a classic. But that's what I'm saying, it, never, it, wasn't, it wasn't a flop. It no. was a success, so it wouldn't have lost money. It's never been like, oh, that's, that was a, that's such a flop, it's lost money. So that's why I, can't, I just can't find how mm. much it's ultimately made. I know it's made more than $426,000. Yeah. Uh, All right. But or pound actually. The old bill's coming to get us now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's a really good film. Really good film. Yeah, so that was Long Good Friday. So Ben, what's your choice for next week, which we'll be releasing on the first of April? Right, so as soon as it's um April Fool's Day. Do April Fool's Day? No, actually, I'm gonna do Killer Party. Yeah. I think that's around about April Fool's. I think yeah. it's around about April. Yeah. Yeah, Killer Party will do. Which is a bit of a random horror film. But mm. it's uh it's one that we've been very remember. cult. Yeah, it's yeah. quite cult. It's going to be quite hard to do research on, but it's not a classic. Well, it's classic. I think yeah, it's a cult classic. It's classic amongst those. Yeah, those people know it. People will know it. Like those we, sort we of eighties horror yeah. fans, horror fans will know yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, killer party. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's been a long time since I've seen that. Yeah, I vaguely remember that it's got some weird long opening or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always cut that bit out. <laughs> I always thought with that bit. <laughs> but you can't cut it out there. No, you have to watch the whole thing. But that was always blatantly an add on. Yeah. Because the film was so short. To, to fluff it out, yeah. But we will, we will talk about that. And I like the ending of that film. It's got a good ending, a very good ending. Right, okay, yeah. So next week it will be, yeah, a killer party. Yeah, so we hope you have a happy Good Friday. A long, not necessarily a long one if you're working. Or a murderous um, one either. Yeah, and uh, happy Easter as well. Yes, happy Easter, and we will catch up with you next week. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Our country's not an island anymore. We're a leading European state. Yes. And I believe that this is the decade in which London will become Europe's capital. That's Having right. cleared away the outdated, yeah. we've got mile after mile and acre after acre of land for our future prosperity. No other city in the world has got right in its centre such an opportunity for profitable progress. So it's important that the right people mastermind 
the new London. Proven people with nerve, knowledge, and expertise. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why you are all here today.